cookies. <laughs> she gave you those cookies. He can't have the cookies. No. She's never <laughs> not me. How do you, how do you get around Katya on that one? Uh, I don't know. He's got to hide the chocolate. It's really dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> she is so driven. Right? Yeah, she is. Uh, even in the restaurant, when I take her with me, I have no peaceful moment. <laughs> <laughs> right? Alex knows. That's right. Continually fierce, in the fierce with my lifestyle. <laughs> exactly. You have to bargain for your potatoes rather than... Yeah, for every little tacos. potato I have to bargain. <laughs> and exchange and trade in and... Ah, awful. Okay. Now, we don't have too much time anymore, right? So use the time to ask questions, to make objections, and to ask for clarifications, uh, in case, you know, things are still unclear. Director of the 
gymnasium there and uh, or textbooks and so on and got married then to Marie von Thurer after he got a position in Heidelberg. He couldn't marry her before he wasn't a professor. Father wouldn't accept it. And uh, so that is the story in which it is embedded. Now, in these Jena writings, he mentions two human potentials. Or today they can be called evolutionary universals because they belong to the human species and as long as we have that, we have been human. As long as we have it, we remain as we are now. But if one of those five will be changed, then we will become other beings. So these five were language and memory, work and tool, and love. So these three. Usually, uh, Hegel and Kant, they think in triplicities. So these would be the three. Uh, then somehow love is differentiated out in recognition. Love and recognition are very close to each other. Um, of course, they are differentiated. So sexuality, uh, you have this case there, what is her name? This poor little girl who killed her lover there. And this Arias. This Arias, Arias, yeah. Um, so there you can study this. I mean, there was sex, they must have studied porno there in order to do their sex, and there was a lot of kinky stuff, and um, <coughs> by the way, I mentioned kinko to a student, and she thought it was kinky, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> kinko said, it's the printing place! <laughs> so, nevertheless, the, um, so in, in this case, when you look at this, there the, these trials, and the social worker, and the psychologist, and so on, Obviously, she uh, was treated sexually in all directions without any recognition. That means she was continually humiliated. And I think that this continual humiliation finally led to an explosion in which she became psychotic and she shot him and she cut his throat and she stabbed him and uh, so that is what people do when they are humiliated or non-respected for a long time. And um, let's go back for a moment. The critical theory is concerned with the self-reproduction of the human species through work. But at the same time, it reproduced itself also in terms of communicative action which maybe Marx did not emphasize enough, and which Habermas and Honneth and so on emphasize, to the detriment of the work thing. I think we have to uh, see both and keep it together. The humankind reproduces itself through work, and at the same time also through, um, through language, through speaking with each other. So uh, language mediated love, and language mediated reproduction. So because we reproduce ourselves also biological, biologically. So there are two ways how we reproduce ourselves, through instrumental action and rationality and through communicative ration and, and action and so on. And this um, is the, um, uh, that is the thing with work and recognition. And there is one woman here, an American woman, Nancy Fraser. She wrote together with Honneth a book, and that is called Redistribution or recognition. So there you have it both together. So both of them think that uh, civil society is sick. One of them, Fraser, uh, emphasizes, and that is Marxist, uh, in terms of redistribution of wealth. I mean, that is progressive taxation of Obama is a way of redistribution. What happened in Cyprus now, where the rich accounts are taken 10% away from it, that is redistribution of wealth. So this wealth is the product of work. And um, that was Marx's idea. We distribute uh, wealth and to see that not 1% can accumulate all that wealth and the others never get anywhere, no matter how hard they work. And on the other hand, Hannes emphasizes this recognition. Uh, and, but what we have to do is to get those two uh, things together. But let me repeat again, look at this woman there, that trial, uh, you know, and what, what the social workers and psychologists and so on have to say. In our language, that is a very good example of what happens 
when a person is not uh, is not recognized. As a matter of fact, Hegel himself had that theory that crimes were committed because of a lack of recognition. So not crimes because people don't have money or are hungry or whatever, but because they don't have enough recognition. And when we have revolutions like the bourgeois revolution, socialistic revolutions, but all the think it has something to do, you know, with uh, with wealth and and has something to do with with hunger of people and nothing to eat and so on and so on. And what is usually forgotten is that in all these bourgeois and socialistic revolutions, there is a stratum of society, the third estate, the bourgeoisie. For a long time, they worked and worked and worked and were not recognized. It's not that they didn't have anything to eat, but they were not recognized. And those on the other side who were recognized, the clergy and the, uh, and, and the nobility, they lived from the fruits of their labor and they didn't find any recognition. Or, for instance, in this country, the, the housewives, you know, the mothers, the stay-at-home wives and so on, they have no recognition whatsoever. And here you see the, the, the connection. They have no recognition because they don't produce surplus value. That means they don't appear outside and in the bank and work in the bank and produce surplus value. Whoever doesn't produce surplus value is not recognized. First of all, he has nothing to eat if he doesn't work, but he is also not recognized. He is nothing. So sometimes you hear women who say, what are we doing? Well, I'm, I'm a housewife. I'm only a housewife. So people have a very low self-esteem. That's another self-esteem is connected with recognition. They have a self-esteem because they are not recognized. Um, so uh, this is uh, just to phenomenally to circumscribe a little bit uh, how important that recognition is. On the highest level of, uh, of history, a state becomes a state really only through finding the recognition of others. That Pius XII uh, made a treaty uh, the Vatican, uh, the, the uh, uh, Empire Concordat with Hitler gave enormous recognition to Hitler so that other people said, well, if the papacy recognized him, then he cannot be so bad. So then we can recognize him too. So, um, and, and down to earth, and, you know, the Ratzinger there uh, deserted, I never deserted the German army because it was never clear if <coughs> the German government was no government anymore and have lost its recognition. Even after Hitler committed suicide, there was Goebbels was the next successor. And then there was also um, uh, the, the, uh, the fellow on top of the German Navy. Who Ad Admiral Dönitz? Oh, Dönitz, yeah, Dönitz took it over. And by the way, there's an old man here in the city who wrote me. I wish I could answer all these people. He was in Reims in France when the Germans surrendered. And uh, Dönitz was there, but then there was also the father of one of the people in uh, in the institute in Frankfurt. What is this? He, he is still alive, I think. And I met him there. Maybe we, um, the guy who, uh, well, the name comes back to me soon. It's a fun. And uh, his father went to Reims and signed the Armistice. And he had agreed with his wife and his son, who is then in the institute, that he would commit suicide afterwards, and he did. He signed already the armistice von, in the First von, World War. Von Papp? No, no. Uh, von, uh, I have it over there, mm. I could look it up. Uh, so, I can look it up afterwards. So, um, nevertheless, he, he wanted to kill himself already in 1917, but then he, he did it in 1945, and... Uh, and the, uh, the guy who is his son, who was in the Frankfurt Institute, he did a heroic deed. He took a U-boat from Brest down from France, from the French harbor, up to Hamburg, under all the uh, uh, forces, the, the American and British Navy and whatever. He sneaked it all through with people whom he took out of a prison, <laughs> took them out of a prison, put them into the U-boat and shipped that U-boat all through the channel up to, to Hamburg and so on. So, and then had some kind of a conversion, and that brings us here, you know, when these young fellows then suddenly met those emigrants coming to Frankfurt again, Adorno and Horkheimer and so on, and that was a completely new world which opened up for them. And so it's a 
about the same age, I think, of Father uh, So, nevertheless, this old man here in town, he was in Rhymes, and he said, you know what? He said, Eisenhower wasn't there. <laughs> he knew something which the history books d don't know. So Eisenhower was supposed to be there. I don't know what happened, but he was there, and, and Eisenhower wasn't there. And he knew all this because he knew the chauffeur of Eisenhower. Eisenhower had a love affair with the woman who drove him in Germany. And it was very, his wife was very upset about it, and it had to be kept secret. So this old fellow is here. He knew the, the girlfriend of Eisenhower, and through her he knew also that Eisenhower wasn't there when he was supposed to be there, and to sign <laughs> that uh, armistice. I hope it's true. I don't know if... I have to, you know, it's, it's too sad that one doesn't have time enough to, uh, to uh, suddenly we have an inn, we have an inn in Germany, uh, the White Horse, the Siebert family, and suddenly somebody from that inn wrote me, he is an in, uh, engineer student and wants to have contact, and one should really, you know, pick up all these things, if one, and maybe I can do it when, you know, when someone comes or whatever. Okay, that's uh, on the side. So, back to your issue there. The um, uh, it, it underlies the recognition underlies really the whole social morality, the whole grammar. You know, so a state um, uh, becomes a state through recognition, and of course, if you have a, take an oath for a state, you you are obliged really to hold this oath as long as that government existed. And even after I was a prisoner, you know, in early in May, the war went, was over. There was still Goebbels there, and he was recognized as the chancellor, and then the Sternitz there also. That afterwards, the German government was completely dissolved, and then uh, the Allies took over in the four partite, all uh, uh, the so the French and the British and the Americans and the Russians governed the country. There was no German state for a little while until the German federal government, and then the German Democratic Republic were established. So the recognition is at the root of all of this. Um, and uh, usually, you know, they think in three terms. So I think what, what Hegel started out with was language and work and love. So it is always in terms of a conclusion, right? When you have a conclusion, you have a first premise, a second premise, and then you have the conclusion. So the first premise is language, and the second one is work, and then the conclusion of both of them is love. And love is extended then in terms of, it's differentiated out in a certain sense uh, in terms of recognition, and then the fifth one is uh, community. So love and recognition and community are very closely connected. So uh, maybe the difference between uh, marriage and concubinage or whatever may have something to do with that recognition which it witnessed by the church or by the state or whatever. So so you can find through the whole social ethical or moral sphere you can find that this recognition is then foundational. And in the recognition is synthesized uh, language and work. Um, so in terms of thesis and synthesis and synthesis you know, that's how it sometimes is expressed. So, but in reality, it is a logical conclusion where you have a basis, you have a middle, a center, and you have then the conclusion. And you can have different figures of this conclusion. That means what is in the middle can <coughs> also, or the middle can be exchanged, for instance. So here work is in the middle, but you could also make language into the middle as a mediating factor but you could also put love into the middle as a mediating factor and so on. So you have to think that, that Hegel and, and Schelling and so on, they think strictly logical. That means no sentence is somewhat arbitrary. They are all conclusions and different configurations of conclusions. So in, in the family, it is, you know, the principle, the principle is marriage, then comes the poverty, that is the center, and then the education of the children, which is the conclusion. The conclusion is the truth, and they talk about the truth. That is the truth. The child is the truth of the marriage. 
and of the poverty. So, uh, and, and so, so the, the same thing with civil society. You have the need system, you have administration of justice, police, and professional organizations. That is the conclusion. That is the peak. That is the goal. So it's teleological. There's a telos. The police and the uh, um, and the professional organization is how civil society uh, uh, somehow sums itself up, in which it comes back to itself. And there again, you can have uh, different configurations of that conclusion, namely exchanging the center, put the need system into the center, and administration of justice in the beginning, and so on, or put the police and so on into the center. Is that what connects the need system and the um, and, and the, uh, the uh, administration of justice and so on? So uh, that means the whole Hegelian or Schellingian system and so on is a huge system of innumerable conclusions in, with premises, centers, and the end of it. Okay, so history as well. So, but we don't have to go all into. You have that all in your on the road map. The the, the duplicity of Kant and, and Hegel are there. So you have all those three things, and, and every time in each of these notions is a conclusion. Or you could say uh, the marriage is the, the notion, the uh, poverty is the judgment, and then the children are the conclusion of the whole thing. And then whatever happens to this, you know, for instance, there are no children, and they have to be replaced by a cat, or um, uh, or that people think, you know, my marriage is already a family. That would be completely off the rocker, and so. But people may have seriously be convinced of that that they are a couple, and they think they are already a family, particularly when they replace the child with a dog. And, and so on. So, and we, we mentioned that already, it's the theme of today, by the way. You know, protocol sentences and judgments, which we use, for instance, don't be judgmental and so on. Judgment means, originally, in the great theological systems, Islam and so on, uh, it means that in the things, intrinsic to things, there is God's thought. And God's thought for Hegel and for Aristotle and so on is threefold. So God's thought of the family contains the marriage and the poverty and the children. And each of them constitutes a totality in itself. So one could very well say that two people could be married without having uh, poverty or children and so on. It would just not be a family. But uh, so poverty in itself, children in itself, they constitute totalities which are again threefold. So the whole system is constructed through to every little word and every little point and to every little comma and, and, and uh, dot. And so so uh, therefore you can see easily when, when a mistake is made. And if some of people come through, you know, with their emotions and so on, you know. So the majority says we want to have gay marriage, you know, but um, that wouldn't move anybody of these people. They said that can be right or it can be wrong, but how do you judge it? Simply that it is the opinion of the people doesn't make anything right whatsoever, because obviously the Germans had all these opinions, it was all wrong, and the Italians had all these opinions, they were all wrong, and so on. So um, when one says progress, you know, it's the same thing. I mean, how, how does one measure it? So. How would how would a uh, Hegel guy or Schelling or Kant or whatever how would they say they would say the public opinion you know uh, vox dei vox populi you know it can be the voice of God but it can just be the the vote of the the, the the opinion of the mob so you have to differentiate now what it is you know and how how do you do this well let's see homosexuality um, the or masturbation or anything like this. It is always measured, that means what, what is really done is measured against the notion of the family, for instance, or the notion of the organism. So the organism is also a conclusion in terms of the form of the body, the assimilation process, and the, the species act, and so on. So uh, homosexuality simply does not fit the notion of the organism nor does masturbation or whatever. I mean, now where the mistake comes in there, he would, be, would go into 
a singularity. That means one would have to go to a medical doctor. How healthy is this guy? How healthy is his sexual apparatus, you know? How healthy are his sexual emotions, and so on and so on. So all that comes in, but the fundamental orientation, I mean, of the whole um, Occidental and, and Oriental issue as well, and Horkheimer says, you know, there, there was no morality without theology, at least in the West, I think in the East as well, because you have this Trinitarian thing, you know, in, in by Lao Tzu, and you have that in Hinduism, and you have it also in Alexandrian Neoplatonism, and so on. So it is, I mean, what I would say is, it is the work of thousands and thousands of years. And then you will really see what kind of a shock that is as soon as the third estate makes a revolution. This is the third estate. They are not people, you know, trained to govern or trained to think or whatever. They're all shopkeepers. They're all smacks, blacksmiths. They're all bakers. I mean, the whole family was bakers and, and innkeepers and, and so on. So that is the third estate, and they are practical people. That means they have instrumental rationality, and um, that means they know what to do with their hands, techne, with the tech, technical people. And that's why they made this unbelievable progress. That is third estate, that light. These steel buildings, these glass buildings, these tanks, these cars, these airplanes, all that is the third estate. Never did feudal lords or slaveholders ever produce anything only similar. That means they have they have realized the dreams which people had for two hundred thousand years to fly, for instance. So, so that's amazing now. But with this, you know, with this technical knowledge and this analytical understanding comes something. Analytical understanding can take things apart, but it cannot get it together anymore. That means they cannot think in terms of totalities. They cannot think in terms of conclusions anymore. And that has something to do with when you go through Chicago, you'll see they didn't know how to end these damaged sky skyscrapers. And so they put some a temple on top of it, or put a cathedral on top of it. They, they could have put 20, 20 more stories on top of it. But it didn't go. They had to end it somewhere. And some just despaired and didn't put anything on it. And it looks miserable. So, and others said, well, we have to put another Athenian temple on it with the Athena or whatever, with something. And you have that not only in architecture, but you have it in, in poetry too. So Brecht made about 20 endings for his uh, the, the thing there. What is it called in Chicago there? The um, uh, woman there, what's the drama he wrote about? The stockyard. The stockyard, stockyard yeah. St. John in the Stockyard. Yeah. St. John in the Stockyard. Yeah. <coughs> So and, and never found an ending neither. So <laughs> and it goes also into real life. You know they don't know what to do with funerals because you know you have the premise, the, the birth and the youth, and you have the second premise. You know your adulthood. Then comes uh, uh, senescence, and then comes death, and there is no damn conclusion. So when Abraham died, you know he had a fulfilled life. And he was saturated with life. He was 120 years old <laughs> and had a child when he was 100. So, but he had fulfilled life. Nobody can say this anymore nowadays. It just ends. And there was a, a, a poet there in, a, in, I think I told you a story, in Switzerland. <laughs> and he had a partner. And um, so he told the partner what to do when he died. And so he wanted to have his coffin to be put into the cathedral, I think it was Zurich or whatever, Zurich. for a few minutes. A few minutes. <laughs> then take him out, and then the, the partner had to read something. Coffin was standing in the street, and the priests were nice. They let him do it. They didn't understand the word, but if you want to do it, <laughs> do it. And so she read this, and then they out and drank beer somewhere. But, you know, that thing, how am I observed that, you know, that they still had to go to the cathedral shows, and he t t calls that in an article, the article is called uh, uh, The Knowledge That Something Is Missing, that modern people still have that issue that something is missing. What is missing is not very little. What is missing is the conclusion of the whole thing. That means what is missing is what gives meaning to the premise 
and the second prime minister which find their fulfillment in the conclusion so all these things hang together you see the uh, with analytical understanding you can you can split the atom that is this unbelievable ability you know you can you know, the atom means indivisible indivisible but they divide it again and again and again see that is the and of course let the little genie out of the bottle and it is running all over the place now with North Korea and so on, we can't get it back anymore. So um, the, uh, we can have a sociology of this whole thing, uh, namely which stratum of society did this and is in charge now. They are in charge, you know, and therefore philosophers don't really count, or theologians don't really count, you know. You, you try to instrumentalize, that's so the instrumental rationality, so they instrumentalize everything. Religion they instrumentalize. And they take it serious, you know, as long as it works. Does it work? Does it work? It works. But they have, uh, I, I read this book there of my friend Fox there, which is an unbelievable type of book, you know. I mean, they killed thousands of people. And they didn't know there are colonies down there, Central South America. So the church is supposed to function, you know, and the dictator has its inaugural address there. The bishop is supposed to be there. Or Mayor suddenly didn't want to come. And uh, he said, "How can I? How can I? You know, sub support a government which kills my priests and so on?" So then he was killed himself. So I mean, they were by 1990 or so. There were already 800 priests were murdered in Chile and Argentina and so on. The, the bourgeoisie, you know, murders or whatever cannot be functionalized. Either religion can be functionalized or it's murdered. Why we are on this campus, you know? I mean, why do they have a religion department? Well, they never knew what we are doing. They think we are religious. <laughs> so, when, uh, when Tom Lawson, you know, he was a Baptist minister, whenever there was festivity, Tom Lawson was asked to say the prayer. And so, now, it, it started that way because a bunch of wild Presbyterians, you know, Cybers and Connie Law and so on, they wanted really to have a theology department. And then Tom Lawson uh, changed it, you know. But this change into science of religion is never understood, you know. Even, you know, comparative religion, they, they don't really know what that is. They mean that people are made religious or something like that. And that is why it gets paid for. Now, when there is a crisis, the religion department is the first one we saw the list to be cut out, and we have that in 1980. Um, they, they didn't have any money anymore under this, what is the student center called the, um, not the president under whom it happened. Bernhard. Hmm? Bernhard. Bernhard Center, yeah. Bernhard was this, um, was a very religious person, but there was no money anymore, so they had to cut something. And religious department was right away on the list. So we are going under another name. It is, they don't know, that is the scientific study of religion, or they, because in Germany, it uh, it got through, and it didn't get through, by the way. It, theology kept control. So in Germany, you still have theology departments everywhere. I studied in one, in a state university in Mainz. And so. But here, somehow, this science of religion took off. But it is only for real educated people who do that. Other people always think, you know, that this is supposed to make people pious, and also in terms of everything that it makes them to read the Bible and then they will be, want to be, be able to govern them better. That is bourgeois type of thinking. And therefore when the communists you know, persecuted religion, that was a stupid thing. They should have learned from, uh, from the bourgeoisie. And Stalin did. When he was attacked then, then he allowed the farmers to take out the icons out of the backyard again and open up the church. He even set up Stalin set up the Patriarch of Moscow. They didn't have Patriarch, and, and then Stalin introduced him. So um, they, they suddenly got the idea, you know, that it's much better to make use of it. And so on. But uh, all that remains instrumental, right? So instrumental. Thing. Now, there's nothing bad about this. We cannot reduce instrumental thinking. We would all starve to death. So somehow what the bourgeoisie has introduced, it has to be continued. We have this population now. They have to be fed. We need a lot of in engineers, a lot of machines and so on, if we don't want to have more people starving to death than do already. 
So, but on the other hand, the question is now this uh, uh, communicative rationality, which is rooted in language and which is rooted in love and uh, also in recognition and in the community and so on. So, really, most of these universals are concerned with communicative rationality. Only one is concerned with instrumental rationality, work and tool. But in spite of the fact of that, what really happened was that the civilization was determined by instrumental rationality and that the promises of instrumental rationality were kept was what if you have Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci or whatever, they made uh, pictures of U-boats and airplanes and everything. That was fulfilled, but the other side, uh, communicative rationality, that was neglected. To some extent, we sold our soul for this unbelievable uh, progress which we made. And when the students come from Saudi Arabia or wherever, they want to have that instrumental rationality because they want to get water into their deserts or whatever, they want to, go to get their oil or whatever. They don't come here for community rationality because that they have in the Holy Quran, that they have in the Bhagavad Gita or they have in the, in the, in the New Testament or whatever. So, okay, so that, uh, so it is an, uh, an, now if any of those five would be changed, for instance, if memory, you know, if we, we would map the brain now and we would find, you know, the elements which are responsible for our remembrance and we can manipulate it, we can uh, take the memory out of a person or put another memory into a person or whatever, that would really, you know, change the human nature. This is really possible that man can now change his own, uh, his own nature so that language could simply become a signal, uh, a signal machinery like red and green there when you when you stop with a car or whatever it becomes all automatic without any reflection or whatever so and that has happened already if you look at the language the english of shakespeare and the english which is spoken here in the streets or whatever or what the businessmen do it is an unbelievable impoverishment of the language which has happened in those 400 years so um, but the uh, in the totally administered society, it would be a signal society. That means language loses all its expressive power by which we can, our own inner world and the external world and all that we can uh, make that like a poet can or a novelist and so on, uh, represent, represent it. And not only signal that you have to stop or uh, you have to go on and so on. So. Uh, that would really get at the very roots of the species already, wherever. There was a famous man who was connected with the Frankfurt School, Kraus. He was a language guy in Munich, and um, he uh, uh, dug into this, and Adorno did this too. And so uh, then, uh, the, uh, of course, in terms of sexuality, you know, what, what will happen to that if one will have... Uh, just some people who are, have the calling to have children and educate them and others have no gift whatsoever so um, that one, you know we have that already in Germany, partnerships, you go to a hotel and there's marriage and there's partnerships and so people say no don't want a real family, we want to, don't want to have all this we, we want just to have a partnership you know so, um, and so it depends how far it goes um, but so this recognition uh, or non-recognition so we have to see the positive and the negative um, it's a very powerful thing and I think more than people know you know it's work is more visible that recognition you know or the lack of it which people can suffer you know most people are never in the newspaper paper they never find any public recognition recognition except the day when they die and somebody puts a few verses, uh, substance in there, you know, was a good guy or whatever, and then he disappears forever, and there was no recognition whatsoever. So, if you are a bus driver, in, um, as my son, the uh, Iran, you know, who recognizes you? I mean, who says you are a good bus driver? You, uh, you know, you're a good human being or whatever. Nobody says anything, you know. So, um, all is instrumental and instrumentalized. <coughs> and that's the majority of people to whom that happens. Okay, so uh, recognition is at work 
in the family, is at work in, uh, in civil society, if you think who is put up as a role model, uh, sports people have this recognition, uh, coaches, you know, have this recognition, and the, uh, the, there's a coach living downstairs, uh, my God, um, and if you are doing the wrong thing then, um, you know, the people are hardly disappointed, um, priests, you know, ministers have a certain amount of recognition, and uh, you see from the intensity of the disappointment how high that recognition was. There can be false recognition, you know, of movie stars and so on, and then, of course, it usually breaks down at a certain point, and then people are horribly disappointed and so on. So, uh, recognition is an unbelievable power, also false recognition that people who should be recognized are not, and those who should not be recognized are, you know, uh, criminals sometimes find high recognition and become uh, a symbol for the whole society. The, the Southwest, they're roaming around freely and so on, so if somebody breaks loose, then uh, sometimes he becomes a hero, a gangster who becomes a hero and gets tremendous recognition and so on. So the whole it's a whole order of recognition which penetrates all our relationships. <laughs> the um, Habermas and uh, Hanneth thought that Horkheimer and Adorno maybe uh, lost that what is most important for sociologists, um, and that one of these elements was recognition, and that is why they concentrated on it. And by starting with recognition, they wanted to go around because the Hegel, this whole system is an elaboration of these five human potentials. So uh, the, it seems, you know, that Parsons, uh, that happens too, you start, you know, with individual interaction, and the more you think through, it turns into a system, in reality and also in thinking. So, but uh, the Frankfurt School people thought there's something ideological about systems. So, therefore, they were opposed to systems, but so they started out with the foundation of the system and tried not to uh, do, go the systematic way, but, uh, you know, to, uh, because the dialectic of recognition, uh, he how Hegel describes it, is unbelievably concrete still, and they are attracted by this concreteness. Concreteness is true, and uh, the abstraction is untrue. So. Also, Hegel learned from Adam Smith and Ricardo and Zeiss and uh, described the dialectics of labor, of work, too, the dialectics of language, the dialectics of sex, sexuality. And so, and uh, when he started out with this, it was very sensuous and very concrete and so on. And then the more the system, it became abstract. But uh, we have to see here this uh, because when you have the formal logic, the traditional logic, Abstract and concrete mean something else in the dialectic logic and in the abstract logic which you get when you have a course on critical thinking. Then you learn this abstract type of formalistic type of logic. And it's very often boring and they have to put a lot of psychology into it in order to make it interesting and so on. So, um, but there is the empirical concreteness and he would not say no to this. So. Uh, for all of us, you know, we think that tree or whatever there, what we can touch and see, that is concrete uh, in an empirical sense. But then there is another concreteness, and what is really concrete is the conclusion of things. So, the family becomes concrete in the child. That is why Marx there said, you know, we, uh, we can forgive Christianity a lot because they, it taught us to worship the child. Uh, the child is the concretization of the parents and so on. We would say, you know, the sex of the parents, that's physically, that's empirically concrete. But uh, only when the notion comes together, the truth of the notion is reached. That means the conclusion is reached. The notion, the judgment, and the conclusion. Only in the conclusion, things become really concrete. Concrete means congressor. It means to grow together. So the family, the property, and the children grow together. And this totality is the truth. And this totality is concrete. 
But this type of a concreteness is different from having the concreteness sitting, you know, in a little Edis Addison walking out here and scratch out, <laughs> walking out. That seems to be very concrete, you know, because the little guy, little thing, little girl, you know, she walks on her little legs and, 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 uh, and suddenly she gets angry, she hates the world, you know, and then she gets something to eat and then she's very fascinated again by eating and forgets all about her anger and so on. So this is concrete, that is empirically concrete. So in, in general, this type of thinking, you are supposed to go to the level of dialectic reason, but you can always go step lower again. You can always go to that, what is called the usual talk, and Habermas has that too. There's the everyday language, everyday language in the everyday life world in turn. Uh, these um, languages of the poets and the scientists and such, they differentiate out uh, these languages, out of the everyday language. But you can always, you don't have to move, you know, on the level of dialect and a little understanding. You do that in physics or whatever. Then you go home and you enter again the normal life world, the everyday, the usual language. If you wouldn't, they would think you're nuts and so on. So if you ha go through psychoanalysis and suddenly you have a date, and you have say, beloved, how is your superego doing, and how is your id functioning, and so on and so on, it would be absolutely stupid. So, in order to be healed in psychoanalysis, you have to go through this psychoanalytical language, but then you have to forget all about it. If you don't forget about it, you are sicker afterwards than you were before you got into it. <coughs> okay, so anything else, Alex, about the recognition thing. We have it on the level of history, recognition of states, which constitutes the states. We have it in marriage where they say yes to each other. Uh, in, uh, so what usually constitutes marriage is that yes, they come together either arranged or, or by their own choice. And But what makes the what constitutes the marriage is the mutual recognition. Do you take Jean, Jean, do you take John, and so on. This yes is the mutual recognition. So it is in the family, it is also in civil society, in the contract, for instance, where the two partners recognize themselves as contracting partners, so that rests on recognition. And the same thing in the states, of course, and then also when people make laws, you know, these laws rest then on a consensus by which they recognize that they want to have gay marriages or don't want to. So uh, the gay marriages can be recognized by a community or not. Um, if a bill is introduced, the bill is accepted and so on, then this is recognized. That is real now. They can now get married and so on. Before that, it was not recognized. So you have it in the state, you have international relations and so on, everywhere. In religion, by the way, too, you know, to let God be God, for instance, you know. Um, if people, you know, want to force God to give him something or whatever, that is a lack of recognition, you know. But usually theologians would say, let God be God or so, means to recognize him in his sovereignty uh, and uh, that, uh, you know, that he will be uh, the idea you know, that God wants to help all people and so on but you cannot force him. That is the lack of magic, uh, where you want to force God to do certain things. And, then, um, and, and you have that in higher religions too, in Catholicism you have that. You know, I go to Mass every day, and therefore you have to bring my son back from, to, from Russia. And then the son doesn't come back from Russia, he dies in Stalingrad, you know. And then people are, um, you know, they thought that going to Mass, you know, should prevent them to die from cancer or whatever. And, it doesn't do that. So that has something to do with uh, recognizing God in his sovereignty and that uh, nobody can interfere with this. And by prayers or magic or fetishism or whatever, it doesn't help. Now, when you talk, we, you were talking about the concrete conclusions where mm -hmm. you have a marriage property mm -hmm. and that children constitute the right. marriage. 
Yeah. So does property then become part of the definition of marriage? Or it is a it is a premise, right? So if we talk in logic language, um, the conclusion rests on premises, and so property is a premise, yeah. Uh, but not only in the head or whatever, but uh, uh, outside in reality. So now in reality, you know, <coughs> let's say a social worker comes into a family and uh, she says you have this family seabird, you know, and then they go in the house and they're shouting and screaming all over the place and they have the impression that's not really a family, you know, this is a chaos, you know. So that means that somebody who is not philosophical at all whatsoever, or not religious at all, uh, makes a judgment in which two things are connected, namely that what he sees, empirically, is chaos, and on the other hand, this idea of what a family should be like, you know without spelling it out. So they may say there is no poverty there, you know, there is no there are no family allowances allowances, no family wages and so on. And that is a defect then, right? Isn't the property the objectification of the mutual recognition? Yeah. And that's I why mean, you could say so there is you know, the first premise is marriage and then they would objectivate themselves, uh reify. Reification also for Marx is not only a bad thing, right? You Reify yourself as long as you can dissolve the reification again and come back to yourself. Why do you have to re reify yourself in marriage? Because you have to objectivate yourself. You see, everything what is inside has to be outside in order to be real. So, um, therefore, if you just keep that you love her, nothing will come from it. You have to put it into words, you have to bring flower. Uh, it has to be shown, you know, that you really love her. The people say, why well, do you have to say, I love you? No, you, I love you. You don't have to say it all the time. You do have to say it all the time because it, things have to be objectivated in order to become real. So subject and object have to become one in a certain sense. So freedom, if you only have the potential of freedom, live in a slum, and you cannot realize your eyes, your ears, your touch, and so on, your freedom will be abstract. It will not become real. It will not become concrete. Okay, but this private property thing, so the lovers would objectivate themselves in the house, in the car, or in, in their skills, which they learn, you know, and so on. <laughs> and then a second objectification would be the child. Uh, and it is in the property, particularly in the child, in which they also come back again. This returning is important, see, because the third is always a return to the first one, at the same time containing the middle term. Logically, so in the in the conclusion, the first and second premise come together. They are synthesized. They are united. That's where it becomes concrete in that other sense and fulfilled. And the truth. That's what's called the truth. In in this type of of a thinking there, but that is tremendously widespread. So the whole natural law tradition and so on, all of this is present. So, so what is your what is your question again? I guess if property means something different from what I was mm -hmm. anticipating initially when listening. If property means that you put your will into a car and say, this is my car. And if somebody hits that car, it hits you at the same time. And you feel violated in your right that he killed, uh, damaged your car and so on. So it is the first, the most primitive form how freedom is realized by putting your will into a house and say this is mine or this is my car or this is my book property rights and books and whatever so poverty is about 10,000 years old so the hunters and fishermen and so on had no poverty yet, private poverty they owned everything in common but then with the villages um, people said this is my piece of land and this is my plow, and so on. That's how private poverty came about. So in those societies, there would be no marriage? In which society? In this oh, oh, yeah, I see what you mean. No. <laughs> well, I mean, you can have collective poverty. They were married among hunters and fishermen and so on, right? So they did have their arrow and their bow and their arrow, and, but it was all in common. Uh, you can have a marriage in a kibbutzim. They, they are married you know, in a kibbutzim but they have poverty altogether. And the children, you know, the children are um, also then in a, in a 
kindergarten, you know, they are not with the parents, and so, but they have changed in the kibbutzim. It's interesting how these fundamental notions assert themselves anyway in time. So, in the meantime, the children do go home to the parents. So, they still have common poverty, but their children are there more than they were before. They do change things. So, so we have a fundamental nature of the family, in a certain sense, and what the reality is, you know, comes closer or not so close to that concept. The idea is even, you know, a real family is one in which those elements are there. Um, if even the most chaotic family, you know, will have a little inkling of that nature of this notion in order to exist at all, it would totally disintegrate if there was not something of it present. So uh, that means on one side we have the empirical level, the sociological level, the psychological level, etc. And then, you know, something can exist without being real. So you can have a marriage which exists for decades, you know, but it is, has long not been real any longer. You can have a religion, you know, which is still around, but it's not real anymore. It's not true anymore. It's not good anymore. Uh, the Greek temples, you know, stood for centuries and nobody believed a thing anymore. So the facade can stay and the truth has moved out, <coughs> out of a family or out of a religion. <coughs> we turn to religion like they have it in the sociology department, you know. Um, the question is what has really returned, you know. Um, I mean, if a Marxist suddenly puts candles up, in Yalta, as I saw it, you know. Does that mean religion has now returned? I mean, has a little magic returned, you know, that when you put up a candle you will be healed or whatever, you know, what has really returned? And but it's very hard for a positivistic type of a sociology to, to do this because they have, um, they have separated or they have cancelled like the difference between appearance and essence. So the appearance is the essence. And thereby you cannot compare the appearance with what the essence is. In the uh, logic, being and essence together constitute the notion and the idea. So if you separate those two, it is interesting in the, um, in the ontological proof of God, you know, I have an idea in my head, and this idea, you know, uh, is the most perfect idea. But the most perfect idea must contain being, otherwise it would not be the most perfect idea. Uh, already from the very beginning, from Anselm of Canterbury, the bourgeoisie had a hard time. That you can think hundred dollars doesn't mean that you have hundred dollars. <laughs> not seeing, you know, that the infinite notion is something different from a finite notion, and the bourgeois, of course, right away thinks of money, and even Kant did this, you know, the, um, and was against the ontological proof, so, but that the highest being, you know, the uh, essence or notion is at the same time contains being from its very start, it's not something which is added to it. Only finite things are contingent, they may or may not be but the absolute notion is intrinsically contained, the essence contains being, and being and essence is contained in the notion or the idea, that is what the... So the, the idea for Hegel is a the series of definitions of the absolute. The absolute is being, the absolute is essence, the absolute is the measure of all measures, or measure of all things, uh, the absolute is the idea, or the absolute is the notion in turn. So um, that is this and, and it is rooted in Plato, it's rooted in Aristotle, and was combined with Kant, and that is the background of this whole thinking. But we don't have to go into that. You know, we, we stay in the sociological thing. And even for a sociologist who is no philosopher anymore, no theologian anymore, entirely positivistic, you know, a social worker, who still, you know, sees that difference, he may call it differently, he may call it its non-function. It's a dysfunctional state, it's a dysfunctional family, or something like that. One can express it in functionalistic terms, <laughs> but what it really means is that this family or this marriage is not really real. <coughs> it exists, 
it, it, it's revealed to a little bit, so it still shines through what the family was, but only a very little of it. Okay. So, I mean, um, when we look at it, as we do here, you know, when we are sociologists, we um, at least say that there is uh, also a critical theory, you made that clear, um, and uh, even when you think in terms of court, you know, theology, philosophy, science, we would add to it, this is true, but science also contains still theological elements. It contains still philosophical elements, which may have become unconscious. But in order to understand the discipline of sociology really fully, one has to see its genesis, how it developed. You know. In sociology now is done what was once done in social philosophy, um, or also in, uh, you know, in, in terms of government, you know, uh, how to govern and so on, that went into political science. So the science is all, you know, differentiated, differentiated out, but it is philosophy out of which they differentiated out. And Kant, you know, observed that, right, so we would simply um, add to it, you know, that <laughs> that when philosophy took the place of theology, not all theology was simply nothing. And when the sciences left behind philosophy, uh, it was not completely gone or whatever. There is something preserved in it, which one may ignore or which one may even hate. Um, every generation of positivists, you know, tells the others that they are still metaphysicians, you know. And then they want to do it better and clear out the last residuals of metaphysics but then comes a new generation and find out little pieces of metaphysics anyway again. So they just cannot get rid of it because that's where they are coming from. <coughs> okay. I think I understand the, the logical structure of the, the premise, yeah. the, the center and then the conclusion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like on some level it strikes me as kind of arbitrary what kind of content put in there to constitute the family yeah, or right. you're, you're making, you're taking an idea and then putting a couple of constituent elements and then saying that if you don't have those, it seems kind of definitional and arbitrary. Yeah, right. Now for you see right away and automatically you see it when you talk about the conclusion as something subjective, something which we do, you know, so and arbitrarily we set up those three things. And arbitrarily, we could up set up six things or four <coughs> things or whatever. But for those, for the, from Aristotle to Hegel, um, for them, that was not only a subjective thing in terms of language, but it was something in the tree itself. So the form of that tree is assimilation process in terms of radiation of the sun and sucking in the water with all the chemicals in it and so on, and thereby growing, getting bigger, bigger, and so on you know, it happened there, and then coming to the conclusion, namely to have the little fruits up there which are falling down then, and suddenly new trees like this guy, uh, uh, Chinese elm, are suddenly coming up, and so on. So this is, you know, the form, the assimilation, and the species process. Now, that is not empirically concrete. At the moment, we don't see the fruits. It will come and fall. You know, for the moment, they are not there. They are not com empirically concrete. But in terms of notional thinking, you know, the notion is the subject. It is that thing independent for me. So uh, that means the family itself uh, went into judgment because the German word means fertile. That means an original partition uh, in terms of branches and so on, branches out. So a lot of things with Heidegger have that too, you know, to, to take the German language and it, uh, it is very telling you know, the words already. So you have this ur time. Ur means original time division, you know. So the thing itself, not you, the thing itself divides itself. When you write a book, you can see that, you know, I, I see this fatally there, how um, when you write, it divides itself up, like in a tree, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, somehow independent from your own, when you're, you're doing it, you know. But it has its own dynamic itself. So that means they think that the family 
um, uh, you know, the, the two meet and become one, and then the dialectics of love starts. And out of this dialectic of love, it becomes assimilating it. They have to eat, they have to drink, they have to have a space of intimacy in which they live, and so on. And finally, also the child comes. And it, it's, it, there's the element of inner necessity. I have my oldest daughter, they had to, th- to go to the psychoanalyst in order to find out that they needed a child. They, you know, they were so perverse in, in this American culture that they thought they could do without that. But uh, suddenly there comes a time where the child is due. I mean, you could say psychologically, but you could also say ontologically. That means it belongs to the notion of the family that there comes the time, and that is translated into psychological prejudice, in neurotic attacks, in hysterical attacks, and, and so on and so on. That is a psychological imp- expression of what is going on ontologically. That means the being of the family itself demands that, independent of the subjects which are involved in it. You can violate this, but you will risk your relationship. It will break down. It will disintegrate. And that timing of when you... What, it you is timing. From? It has its own time. Not you are timing. Well, when it's timing itself. That's yeah. not a culturally encoded uh, Yes, yeah, well, that's what we would say, you know, we would say, oh, this is cultural. But is it really, or is there not in all cultures, you know, like uh, like Siggy Jung would do it on the psychological level, you know, but if there are not patterns, uh, let's say pattern, you know, is a word for it, um, which are underlying all these civilizations, so that no matter what civilization let's see in the last 200,000 years, you know, and then the great civilizations of the Euphrates Tigers and so on and so on, we could see what um, what variations took place of this pattern. Obviously, sometimes you have polygamy, you know, so you have one man and different women, and you can have one woman and different men and so on. Um, you have more poverty, less poverty, collective poverty, and I mean, your poverty is social security into which you pay. That is a form of poverty, you know, or, or health, health insurance or whatever. So the, the, the elements can have tremendous variations, but it still is the, the issue of the child in the end and so on. So now all these people who are against birth control or whatever, or homosexuality or whatever, they all operate with something which is cultural, but they would say that in this cultural something, something else is still at work. And they would call that the thought of the God, or the Logos, and so on. Uh, what we can do, we can do variations, but we cannot do all. There are certain things, when you do them, you know, you will fail. That means it will simply disintegrate. It becomes unreal. And finally, it doesn't exist. Remember that this is unreal, people say very often, you know. I mean, there is something in the, the language is much more philosophical than people think, you know. Like when they say, don't be judgmental, you know. What does that really mean? I mean, don't tell me, you know, what I should do, or don't tell me that I have done something wrong, or whatever. And when you tell me that, that's simply cultural, or that's simply subjective, and so on. But the question is, is it all just cultural and subjective, or is there, can we penetrate to what is true? You know, that is the issue. That means not only statements of our theme today, you know, that something is correct. Protocol sentences are correct. And we all have only protocol sentences left. There is no truth left in the university, which is a tremendous crisis, you know, because the university was originally established to do nothing else than to find the truth. And now, you know, when you bring a judgment into it, you're supposed to be value-free. Now, with Weber, it's very strong. With Amy Durkheim, there are some values. But even with Weber and Parsons, you know, you have... uh, the survival of the civil society, that's really the value. All things, pattern maintenance, goal attainment, integration, all that serve, these structures, all serve one thing, the survival of civil society. And the survival of civil society is supposed to be something good. And this, that ought to be. And But also in different ways. They take, for instance, the values which are there in the neighborhoods. So they say these are not our values as sociologists, but 
we recognize that people in this community have these values and therefore we cannot do this and this. We cannot have this type of advertisement, this type of movie or adult stores or whatever because the community around him holds those values. So <coughs> only they, they don't, as sociologists, they don't have values. But then we look into it and we see they have values after all because the whole Parsonian system, you know, is um, evaluates, you know, that it is good that civil society survives. Why the hell should civil society survive? Why not a socialist society instead? Why not a feudal society before? So, um, but so <coughs> not to speak, you know, that Parsons took from Paul Tillich the idea of ultimate reality, which he put on top of his system. So, <laughs> the culture is open toward the ultimate reality, you know, now, the ultimate reality doesn't do anything, like the god of deism, you know, it doesn't work into the system. Otherwise, they couldn't have a system. It could not be scientific, because arbitrarily the god could create miracles. Uh, so, but as people relate themselves to the ultimate reality, they are supposed to act differently. So we think people who relate to ultimate reality will not get divorced, will take care of their children, will do their job, will work, will not be lazy, and so on and so on, you know. So that means people relating themselves culturally to the ultimate reality will behave somewhat differently. And uh, so it has a certain integrative power, which is not said to be good, but from the whole way how the system is set up, it is, it seems to be good. And, and so if you say, you know, this is a good family, this is a good state, this is good school and so on, you always have to have something empirical which you compare with some kind of thing which you may call an idea or whatever. And then the question is if this idea is only a cultural one, only in this community, or um, if it is, if there is more to it that we can really penetrate the truth and that uh, variations of that truth happen everywhere. But uh, so different forms of poverty, different forms of educating children, uh, for instance, um, Socrates thought you know the state should educate his children. He didn't even think that this was part of the family. And so I mean, there can be, and you know, also uh, an analogy. Um, uh, this this thought of God in things is the innermost law, and it's been called the natural law for thousands of years. But it is similar to the outside laws of physics. You cannot simply ignore the law of gravity. I cannot simply go up on my roof there and say, I'm flying now. And people would think I'm nuts, and if I would really do it, I would break my neck. And something similar is that you cannot simply, when you, when you say this thought is in, in the state, and so you cannot do with the state or with the family or with civil society whatever you want to do. Uh, so that is uh, mythically uh, uh, also expressed in the Tower of Babel, uh, or in the saying like, the trees do not grow, or whatever, in the sky, or whatever. So the feeling that the absolute is the measure of all things, and uh, if you overstep that measure, there will be consequences. You know, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, whatever, these, if they have existed or not, you know, there's always a question, they want to find where Sodom was, and then they find it in the water, it's really in the Dead Sea, you know, it's underwater and so on, but this is all has nothing to do with the story. That story is what you can do and what you cannot do, and if you violate those thoughts in things, things will rebel. Nature will rebel, you know, that's global warming, you know, they're in a popular way, you know, that's what people say we behaved in such a way, you know, that nature now rebels against it, or the ozone sphere uh, disappears and so on. In nature that is more visible. In the ethical realm, in the human realm, uh, freedom, you know, it is uh, just, you know, very often not so clear. <coughs> but um, civilizations have gone under, and um, the, uh, the biblical stories, you know, and also the myth of other religions, you know, show how far one can go um, and then one, if one loses all measure, um, things will rebel and will fall apart. You know. <coughs> but the question
question is, you know, how how to be able to think that and this type of education always belonged to a small group, to priests, you know, in the temples in the Euphrates and Tigris Valley or the Nile Valley and so on, who knew mathematics and through mathematics they got to astronomy and uh, so they developed some insights, that's a good word for it, insight into what may be in things, that there are thoughts in things which, uh, which constitute those things. They, they, they would not even exist if these thoughts were not at work in them. And the less these thoughts are in them, the less real they are, the less true they are. So that we then say, this is a failed state. When I talk with the federal government about taxes, and I have this discussion two summers, uh, that Michigan is a culturally failed state, and it always begins that they don't get the idea whatsoever. It takes months. And after a month, they say, you are right, Michigan is a culturally failed state, and therefore individuals have to do what this state is not doing. And uh, therefore, I have these expenses, and so on. And they suddenly recognize them. That means the federal government recognized certain deductions which were necessary and were justified because of Michigan being a failed state. It's a working class state, and they have not done enough in order to bring this working class population to a certain level of, uh, of education. And you could easily see that when you say, take the same stratum of people uh, here in Kalamazoo and you go to Sweden or you go to Norway or you go to Germany or whatever and see how the same level of people, gasoline station attendants, waitresses or whatever, what kind of an education they have and how far they're educated. And you'll see there's a tremendous difference. So that is what a failed state means. But then when I say a failed state, you know, I did not describe like Plato what a good state would be. Um, there is some kind of an intuition which people have when I say it's a failed state. And when they agree, they have to agree on the basis that, that there is a measure by which one can measure that what the state actually does does not live up to what it is. It is not itself. So judgments have something to do with what things are in themselves and what therefore they ought to be. And when they fall short of what they ought to be, then we say, this is not really a family. This is not a marriage. This is a catastrophe. And so on. And people who are not philosophers at all, maybe we can turn it on, maybe everybody is a philosopher in that sense that he can say, you know, this marriage isn't a marriage anymore, or this state is really dysfunctional or failed state, and so on. And people say this all the time. So what the philosopher is doing, he just formulates <coughs> what all people know anyway, somehow. And he just makes it clear or puts it in books where nobody understands. <laughs> it's funny. Okay, anything else? So, um, um, that was recognition, right? So, anything else? Do we have any other questions? Whatever you want to ask, this is the time. We have only two more meetings. I wanted to do something very short on contemporary, contemporary issues there. A contemporary issue is um, um, where we can do what Habermas and Hegel already call <coughs> time diagnosis, time prognosis. And uh, I have a German thing here. Um, the newest thing is, you know, there is a threat from North Korea there. There's a little guy there with a round face, and he looks like a boy, and he makes loud noises, <laughs> and he's surrounded by the army all the time, and he's threatened to attack. He cannot attack the United States, but he could attack Guam, maybe. And that would be bad enough. And he can certainly um, attack South Korea. The capital is only an hour away from the border and he may not do all of this but what one thing which is interesting is China made a certain experiment by putting uh, they are called experiments capitalistic experiments in certain zones like we have this park the industrial park um, some socialistic countries have set up a certain industrial 
Central Park, uh, Hong Kong is something like a park still, but the Chinese have more, where they have a certain zone in which they let um, capitalistic enterprises uh, develop. So, and Kaesang is this place, uh, and I have the maps and everything here, where the North Korea did this. So there is a zone, and there are maybe 120 capitalists have been allowed to come in there and um, and to set up their industry. And they have uh, North Korean workers. And uh, these workers are very disciplined. Now, North Korea has almost military discipline throughout the whole country. They call it Stalinistic, so it is obviously a continuation of Stalinistic thinking, but not all the way. Now, but even Stalin, you know, he had people coming in from capitalist countries who built his factories and so on with Russian workers. My uncles were involved in the 20s and 30s and so So it's nothing new, but um, it sounds a little bit new. And sometimes people think they become capitalistic and whatever. But So what they do, the price is very low, the labor price is very low. So they let these people uh, <laughs> from North Korea, the workers, they let them work in these capitalistic enterprises. They are, they, they, their payment is so low, you know, that no capitalist can really de negate it. He, he has to take it. The offer is so fantastic. Um, they, I think that the, the, the North Korean state then adds something to that, but they let them work for a very low price and also the Working conditions are very harsh, the labor hours are very long, so they produce commodities which are really very cheap and sell them in the West for high prices, and that brings an enormous profit and makes it very attractive. So, But now, the, uh, somehow, the North Koreans have withdrawn from this and uh, want to close up those, uh, this zone there. Um, so and, and but both sides, you know, still get something out of it. So at the moment, it is still going on. The factories are still working and so on. So, but there is a tremendous tension at the moment, not only military level but also on the economic level. <laughs> and um, but that is of interest for us because we know that the critical theory was opposed to fascism. Fascism is an attempt to rescue civil society when it is attacked from inside by socialists. And it's attacked by socialists because the capitalistic system doesn't work. Every soup kitchen shows that capitalism doesn't work. Every food stamp shows that capitalism doesn't work. The market does not go to the people that there are 40 million in the slums. Capitalism doesn't work. So then socialism arises. And when socialism rises and is directed against the ruling class, then the ruling class be, be, pays thugs who uh, then, like Ford, had these thugs in his factory and so on. So, in order to get people, on, could they put them on their place and so on. So, that's what Hitler then did. He put all the communists in concentration camps and marched into Russia and killed 70, uh, whatever, 27 million Russians. So, um, that's what fascism is all about. <coughs> so, now we have already socialistic countries which go beyond capitalism. So, that means they have replaced the bourgeoisie. They have replaced the third estate by the fourth estate. We said that the fourth estate here does not even have any representation. That means we have no Labour Party, we have no Communist Party, we have no Social Democratic Party, nothing whatsoever. So we only have two bourgeois parties. So we are the most outrageous, you could say, bourgeois society, the fewest of all of them, of the very beginning. We never had any nobility, Baltimore, but Baltimore came for three years and left again. So we had no nobility, the clergy was never in charge here. The first and the second estate were always missing. The third estate came from Europe or developed out of the working class, like Ford and so on. They go into the garage and fabricating little fa cars and so on and become bigger and bigger and bigger. So like Carnegie and, uh, and, and so on. So then either the bourgeoisie came from Europe, from England, like Owens, or, so, or they developed here out of the working class and got their own comrades under, under control. So that is the struggle now. So there was a setback. That means the fourth estate had taken over in Russia already. And then there was the neoliberal counter-revolution and the third estate developed again.
again, partially by coming in from outside, or the functionaries who were from the third estate set themselves up and developed newly the third estate by taking ownership of the factories of which they were just the CEOs before, and now they are the owners. So these are the oligarchs. So you have a group of oligarchs, sometimes Putin put them into prison, but recently in Cyprus he wanted to support them and wanted to rescue the banking system because he had all these oligarchs. So he doesn't want to spoil all the things with, with the oligarchs. But um, they are not supposed to be there. But that is the great <laughs> disappointment for uh, the people in the Ukraine, for people in Croatia, where I go now. And so, so, um, but that has happened. That means a class which had been uh, pushed down, the background and so on, reasserted itself again. So in Dubrovnik, the Ustasa, Ustasa owners, the fascist owners, left for Argentine, and then their grandchildren came back again and bought up all the worker-owned factories, banks, uh, railroads, uh, the uh, airline, and, and so on. So that is the counter-revolution. Counter-revolution means that the bourgeoisie had been subdued, but not sufficiently enough, and with outside help it could rise again, and is now in control again, and the fourth estate is sitting on the bottom again. So the same people whom I knew once as owners of their hotels are now the coolies again, and those who came back from Argentine, they own now the hotel again. They put fine, funny little uniforms on from the old king in Austria, and when I came there the first time after the counter-revolution, I said, what the hell, you look like little monkeys, right? <laughs> who put that on, and so on, then they would because the agents sit up there in the overstory of the hotel and they don't want to talk loud and again. So they were the owners and now they are the coolies again. That's what it means, right? So now this is important because even the churches, you know, are for the poor all the time. Um, it is a treacherous type of a thing with that poor thing. Um, so we have to be with the poor and it is very sentimental. This sentimentalism is, is, is disgusting. <coughs> So, um, who are the poor? The poor are the fourth estate. The poor are not those uh, street people alone. The street people also belong to the fourth estate. There's a lumpen proletariat, you know, the fourth estate people that do not work. But most people of fourth estate work and work and work and never get anywhere because the surplus value is always taken away from them in the bad sense of reification now and objectification, because the worker does not return to himself. The, uh, the substance of his life, what he produces, his product, goes into the hand of a non-worker, who then invests it somewhere else, and so on. So, what goes to Florida, the old worker there, is just the empty shell. His substance is all gone somewhere. <laughs> because what he gets from his product is just his salary, which is a small percentage. And that salary is just there in order to restore his energy so that he can come back next day, including health insurance to make him healthy again so that he can work again, or to go on vacations for two weeks so that he will work better afterwards and so on. So otherwise there is no surplus accumulation beyond that, and so therefore he remains always poor. <laughs> and then, you know, the whole propaganda machine, he sees on television those guys who had 10 cents and now they have 10 billion, and so on, and then he admires even the guy who stole all that from him, which is an unbelievable dummification and so on. So now even when you have the South American church, liberation theologians and so on, and all the sacrifices, people who were killed and so on, when they say, we, you know, the Bible says, and Jesus said a, a very dangerous sentence, the poor will always be with us, the poor will always be with you. So um, when, when, they, when the woman there puts his oil on him and tries it with her hair, uh, and and uh, a sign of love and so on. Then the people, these disciples, protest and say, "We could have taken that money for all that precious oil, and we could have given it to the poor." And then he says, "Let her do this. You know, she has done it for my funeral, but you have the poor always with you." And then, of course, all right wingers, a few lords of the bourgeoisie, can say, "See, he said it. Uh, we shouldn't do anything about this. So you have the poor always with you." And but for Jesus, all what he says is eschatological. That means the Messiah will come in one generation or whatever. And the emperor will last and the poor will last until this day comes. Now when the day is not coming, then this sin suddenly becomes static and empirical forever um, and uh, becomes an ideological sin. So, um, so therefore, one has to even do these heroic people <coughs> and I 
nice to say, you know, what, what do you really mean? <laughs> and this whole charity business, you know, always presuppose that the poor are there, and that there must be poor there, no matter how rich civil society became, it never could uh, remove the poor. The 900 billion dollars which we paid for for Iraq, a lost war, we could have removed all people out of the slum. So, uh, so it is something structural. And so the, uh, the liberation theologians, who uh, then were all silenced by the church, who worked together with the, with the CIA and so on, it's a pitiful type of a thing. And this Fox, you can read the books by Fox. There. Good book. Yeah, a very brave man, you know. All these people, you know, uh, most of my friends have been silenced by a church which uh, made the counter revolution, helped the counter revolution in Poland, and then tried to kill these liberation theologians and, and so on. D don't honor, recognize, recognize Romero and so on, who stood up. And the present pope, the new one, you know, did he really stand up? If he had stood up, they would have killed him. That they didn't kill him, he didn't stand up. He probably cooperated and so on. That would be a very sad thing. <laughs> but um, to say it's structural sins, you know, structural sin is that vast system. And um, so in this thing there, capitalism, you have uh, Bishop, by the way, Gumpleton, who has also been silenced by Rome, and his priests who would say, you know, capitalism is uh, evil. <laughs> so, the, uh, therefore, to when, even when we use a vocabulary like that, sounds good, let's do something for the poor, let's uh, give uh, it a day, three times people came today and collected for some group of poor, and so, so. But the question is always, why this begging, you know? Uh, why, why must there be, when the uh, productive forces have been developed to that extent where they are now, there is no need anymore why anybody should be poor or anybody should be unemployed and so on. And it goes, uh, when somebody says, well, Romney said, you know, it's not the task of the state to uh, produce jobs. Right, the businessmen are supposed to do jobs, produce jobs, but they don't. So there's another one, the cap damn capitalistic system doesn't work. So therefore the state has to come in with a new deal or with uh, public works or whatever. So, uh, the, the, uh, so therefore the issue is rather not to say the poor, but what we, they mean with the poor is the majority of the population. It is a whole class and we can call them with that old fashioned name, the fourth estate. Of course we are not an estate state anymore, but um, it, it, then it's more precise and what we call the middle class, that is the third estate. And when they talk about the hard-working middle class, they mean workers who are well paid and therefore are the middle class. Or they say in Flint, we establish the middle class. The labor unions establish the middle class. That means well-paid workers who are now counting as middle class and they aspire to be middle class. And from the third estate point of view, they want to get as many of these good people there from the third, fourth estate over into the fourth, sixth, third estate. That's what you are in when you think of sociology of sociology. You are people, I don't know where you come from, but you may be people who come from the working class, and now you become get your doctorate and so on. And then you think you belong, and you not only think in a certain sense, that's so it will, you belong then to the third estate, and your parents will be happy about this because you are now uh, CEO or your middle management or whatever. And so um, that is now, we say, you know, the South Americans don't have that. They only have these extremes of very rich and very poor. And the stabilizing factor is to have a middle between the extremes. It's also a, 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 a conclusion, right? It's a logical conclusion. So they are the poor and they're the very rich. And now the center, the middle. And the middle and the center is a good name. Everybody says, I am center, or I'm left of center, or I'm right of center. The center does not even exist. But the center is really uh, is fascinating. Nobody can run for office in Europe or here who does not say something like center, or I'm in the middle, I'm not an extremist or the Republican Party goes to the extreme and he loses the people. And so the middle, which calls the extremes together, um, and that is dialectical thing, that is dialectical logic, you know, but it's not conscious. It is unconsciously that people think that way. There must be a middle, and then there must be also a principle, and then there must be a 
goal on the other side. So, but what we do is the, this middle class. If there was a middle class, there must also be an upper class, of course. But we never mention the upper class. Well, the one percent, you know, whatever. <laughs> but the middle class, which they use in propaganda and advertisements, and so <laughs> are people who have been taken over from the working class. They have health insurance and they have a pension fund and, and so on, and they are the so-called middle class, and they are the mitig mitigating and binding element between the extremes. <coughs> so they have to lose more than their chains. That was the issue, you know, that for the state has nothing to lose except their change, chains. And so the bourgeoisie tries to establish this middle class which is now eroded more and more because of the catastrophe of 2008 where a lot of people lost their houses and lost their pension fund, lost their jobs and so on. That is the erosion of that middle class. And then you have only those poor on one side and the extreme rich, which get richer and richer, who have made a lot of money by this disaster, uh, got a lot of tax monies over to them and, and so on. So uh, that is the issue. And then out of this comes this transition from third estate ruled society into the fourth estate for the state. And that happened in Korea, that happened in China, that happened in Cuba and, and so on. So <coughs> and that is this class thing, you know. Um if it would be lost in the uh, critical theory, the critical theory would really be lost. <coughs> and when we shift from from uh, work to language and recognition, there is a little bit danger that this hardcore issue there will be forgotten. As a matter of fact, Hawkeye and Adorno already, you know, de-emphasized. They never used the word bourgeoisie, for instance, because it became so hostile, and, and, and so they didn't, they didn't want to, uh, you know, make people angry or whatever. And it is, uh, you know, one sh should be tactical and shouldn't make people angry with them, let's say, and so on. But uh, we, we, uh, otherwise, we have to translate things into the clear text. <laughs> and so, uh, we, of course, from the bourgeois point of view, we hate those nations where this has taken place, if it's Cuba or North Korea or whatever. And we are particularly sensitive when they have atomic weapons, so we don't bother that South Africa has had these weapons, that Pakistan has these weapons, that Israel has these weapons. Right? It is that if the class enemy has these weapons, that is the real dangerous point where we become really hysterical. And Hegel today made a speech there and threatened, uh, and we have sent air carriers down there already, and we have these guys, these wing airplanes which have no fuselage there in the middle. To, we send all these dangerous things already down there. <coughs> so that is then class struggle, right? So last struggle is with us. Kaesong is that industrial zone it is called, industrial zone of Kaesong and these industrial zones are in China as well um, and we know what it means. It does not mean that communism, uh, that, that the f fourth estate gives up uh, its rule. It means that the fourth estate may want to learn from the third estate and that's very important because the new society cannot abstractly negate the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie has has uh, had a tremendous accomplishments, and you see it in the Communist Manifesto, where Marx and Engels praise, you know, what the bourgeoisie has done. So it's nothing personal, uh, the movement from one class rule to the other. But the most mysterious thing is how, if the fourth estate comes into power, like in China and so on, you know, if they will give up power because communism means no class rule whatsoever and if one would simply replace the bourgeois rule by the workers rule, it would still be a class rule and uh, so that was Bakunin's argument against Marx and it's a very serious one, you know, if you have the, 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 the working class as ruling class how, you, how do you get rid of them? And uh, so he wanted to have no ruling class whatsoever, no working class as ruling class or dictatorship of the proletarian. Okay, that was our contemporary issue. Is there any comments to this? Um,
about quarter after eight. Did you want to take a break? Yeah, we'll take a little break and have your water and your cookies. And then we can make a decision what we want to have. Here, there is this blind spot. That's it, the secretary, the real one from the higher there. There is judgment, judgment at Nuremberg. We can look at this. There's downfall. We can continue this. There's Schindler's List, and there's the wave. Downfall is the Hitler thing. Have, have you ever seen this? There's the end time thing. That would be good to uh, maybe to look at it. But you decide what you want to do. David, do you know your way there? Excuse me. You know the way, right? Oh yes. Oh yes. Yeah. What the uh, Harvard article came out today. Really? Yeah. What does it look like? You can you can go online, but then you have to fill in a bunch of information in, in oh. order to see it because we get like a year's access or something. So I'm going to send an email to Warren to see if yeah. we get copies of it. Yeah. So. That'd be nice. Yeah. Well, you know what happened, uh, Dustin and my God and I, we wrote an article and it is in the Harvard Journal, the first journal. This First chance, edition, yeah. yeah. So we are right in the middle of it, which is wonderful. And so this just came out too this week. Oh yeah, you've seen this. Hitler's philosophers. Uh, oh, yeah, look at this. That was in prison there, and he was in prison in Landsberg. Munich. Landsberg, yeah. I was only there for a year or so. That's when he, where he wrote my struggle. You got a sympathetic judge. Yeah, they were all sympathetic, yeah. Okay, did you buy it for both of us? I did. Good, very good. Very good. Carl Schmidt, look at this. Ah. And Martin Heidegger. Yay, 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 yay. Oh, the Benjamin. Oh, good, I can quote this right away. I will close my new book there with Walter Benjamin. Oh, good. He's a good guy to open and close with. Yeah. There's right. some deep spirit in him, you know. Oh yes, it was wonderful. So I took that little machine there, which is hanging over there. That mm -hmm. comes from Bader, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Franz von Bader was a friend of you. Uh, he the way back deeper into this. Uh, you know, he didn't want to become a Catholic, but he didn't like the Catholics. <laughs> That's probably problematic. It looked ugly to him. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason why many of them were romantics. Uh. And he didn't like the romantics. He is standing between between religion and the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. He likes some of the Enlightenment, but then also saw the dialectics of Enlightenment. I have tremendous discussions with my people online. You know, they read Jung and they read Freud, and it's fantastic, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm reading Fox. That's what I'm reading right now. This book there that you gave yeah. me. It's fantastic, isn't it? <laughs> it's something else. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, see, the, the the churches, you know, with, with the going, uh, this antagonism between religion and secular, that's one thing. But then there is this class thing, you know, where, where the church has to locate itself in the class struggle. And they always are where the bigger battalions are. Mm -hmm. That means they are with the class which is now victorious, but which also will go soon. So they always come one period too late. Yeah. But all the crimes which Ratzinger did, you know, he did in conformity to the bourgeoisie where he came from. Yeah. That's what I read about today was yeah. the conversion after 68, you know. Well, and I don't believe that conversion really. I think he was always a conservative. Oh, is there? Gregory Baum, I gave him once a book, you know, Fratzinger, in order to see how he was before 68. <laughs> but um, I think it was always in him. He did uh, make some progressive things to the council in liturgy, mm -hmm. with putting the altar in the middle and so on. He was for that. But I don't think it comes up to a liberal Ratzinger ever. And uh, this, you know, that sharpened it then in Tübingen where the students said, you know, Jesus to hell with Jesus yep. and so on. Or a conference was there where somebody said, uh, you are Peter and you are the head of my church or whatever, that this was an ideological sin. And he left the room and... and they all, it was a joke, yeah, yeah about yeah, John the well, 23rd made it, didn't he? Yeah, you? right, yeah. 
And then they laughed about it, and they said, well, you know. Try to, yeah, just try to. And you have to take my throne here because Peter's not here or something, you know. And they all laughed yeah. except for Ratzinger. Yeah, yeah but, but uh, on, you know, most of these people don't really listen to they are my friends there. Philip Beck, you know, in Holland, he said, you know, that there was a grave, and Jesus was in the grave, and that was already elbowed loose. And mm -hmm. I thought he couldn't get away with it, and... So one has to see how one maneuvers in that, you know. Mm. But I still think, you know, after the scholastics um, cannot help and church fathers cannot help, the Hegelian thing, the basis of Mark Eckhart and so on, could be another paradigm for Muslims and for Christians and for yeah. Jews and so on. It will be because you need those categories in order to be able to think through where you want to go. And when these categories are not prepared and worked out, and it's the work of thousands of years, you know, you cannot just sit down and say, let's make something up or whatever. I mean, the thing, you know, reason governs the world, and Exagoras, you know, that took centuries and centuries in order to make a discovery like this. And there is also this all embracing co uh, uh, conclusion, you know, namely the logical idea that means God thinking, nature, and man. So nature is the middle between the two extremes. So that means man studying nature discovered those categories which according to which they were created in the first place. And then you can also put something else in the center. You can take man, put man in the center between God and nature. And then you have Master Eckhart. Then you have uh, uh, Hegel and so on. So there is this uh, um, there is still two different ways to, uh, uh, how do they call this, cataphonic and apophonic approach, you know, so, which then leads to a third one, the breakthrough, and then so on, as my God has this. So the, the normal thing is, you know, to take this thinking of God before he created, and then you find all these categories in, in nature, and the whole history of philosophy is one discovering after the other of those categories. And it is, so these categories are then, you know, for us, time, space, causation, and so on. They're all self-evident, you know, and everybody knows them, and so on. But that took thousands of years for men to discover that, you know. For instance, to, to discover that reason governs the world, that laws govern the world, everything is a miracle. As it is still for uneducated people, you know, the weather or whatever. Since they don't know the laws, they think everything happens new all the time, arbitrarily. Yeah. Mm. And in the Axis time, you know, as Jaspers discovered, there was suddenly a tremendous uh, breakthrough in all parts of the world, you know, the, the, so the Axis age. The Axis age, yeah. yeah where, where they discovered in different places the same thing uh, because the human mind evolved and I don't think, you know, that the mapping of the brain will contribute anything to this whatsoever. Um, we, have, we have this tremendous fascination over the brain. The president just mm -hmm. gave some billions of dollars to for it. Yes. And they should map <coughs> it, of course, but uh, between the brain stuff there, these two pounds or whatever it is, you know, and these discoveries through thousands of years, the connection is not there between those two things, you know. Except that our brain is double of the chimpanzee, and therefore it has these abilities you know, to have those thoughts. But the thought as such, you know, cannot be explained by that mass of the brain. Oh, we will see. Okay, so I, I give you a check then, too, okay. right? Yep. God, what a riddle this man is. He has this barbarian jacket on here. He walked down in short sometimes, too. Yeah, there's a picture of him in an SA uniform in yeah. there sitting down reading something. Yeah. yeah, and you can see him with his little suspenders. There was a priest, by the way. A priest was there who helped him, who wrote the whole thing uh -huh. down, you know. Yeah, he had also some mentors who helped him. People loved him, you know, because he was a little man. He loved the little man. Ay, 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 ay. Okay, kind of so I'll give you a check then afterwards, right? Okay, so... Now, um, 
how much time do we still have? We have about a half hour. Half hour. So, um, if you want to, so what do we want to do? What do you want to see? You want to. Do you want to wave? go with the wave? Do you want to see the downfall? Check out the new one. The downfall? Yeah. Okay. okay. Very good. And then we can look at the Nuremberg thing there, the judgment. Well, all that what we discussed today. <laughs> come up. Here, look what surprise I found in your movie. What is that? Who killed Walter Ben? Oh, yeah, yeah, you gave me this. Walter, probably. Walter, of course, it's off YouTube. Yeah. Do you know the story there about how Walter, Walter Benjamin in Port Boo, he died in Port Boo, and he committed Walter suicide, Benjamin. but there is a group of people who think he was killed by the, probably the socialist group who thinks the fascists killed him. But there's no, there's no basis for this, I think. So, yeah. so I uh, decided to close my book up with him, Walter Benjamin, a tragic, tragic guy. Everything went wrong with him, but could possibly go wrong. Yeah. And he was a friend of Sholem, who is this uh, famous uh, Jewish student of mysticism. And Brecht. And of Brecht on the other side. Between, you know, between the two of them. Between those two extremes, he was the middle. Between them. <coughs> both, both of them loved him. Can you imagine them trying to bring them together? Uh, yeah. We still try to do that. <sighs> okay, so I'll turn around. That's good that this came at the right time. Am I doing something to you at in the back? To pull you around a little more? A am I moving? Subtitles. You're doing just fine. Am I moving your territory? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Imagine the story when okay. we were flying above. We were, we were above the Crimea. And <laughs> the black, the soil in Ukraine is just jet black. Right? And we're we're banked. Very fertile. And so he looks down there and sees this black soil and says. Well, they better build something, or we are coming back. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, it will happen, I tell you. <laughs> well, it has not yet ended. <laughs> Somebody will march in there. All right, and yeah, put all these little chingy eyes and sitting there and not doing anything. Let me see, subtitle. Now, is this now German? <coughs> we have to see if we get it in English if it's, if it's there. Yeah, in a second. Huh? What is it? Thank you. Yeah. I didn't think of it, what it was. <coughs> a sense. That must be that icing area. They were not very much beloved, these two, when they came up with this movie. Ah. That is her. That is the secretary whom he hired, the middle hired. Frau Jung. Yeah. She was about 20 years old when she was hired. And she was very nervous. Because so Hitler there, you know, and there she had to type for him. And she typed the wrong thing. And then he said, well, just go out and rest a little bit and come back again. So he was really very nice. Fate has moved her. It looks at the same thing. They all have this fate thing. Is in the Volkschanze? Yeah, that is, uh, I think it's the Volkschanze. This is an East Prussia, from where he directed the Eastern campaign with the three million men. And then he went down to the Ukraine. 
and then he had a dacha upon which he covered. Yeah, for sure. But the two so that is there they are, yeah, just in between. He poisoned the dog first in order to see that the pills would work. Berlin train station. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, God. It was a, a Russian one. Really? Mm-hmm. 
So that is in the bunker now in Berlin. So he moved from his body was taken by the Russians by Chukov. The Untergang. Yeah. 